Hey there guys, this is Mr. Marek. In this video, we are studying fluid flow continuity, which is basically a fancy way of saying we're going to describe how fluids move. Um, we're primarily concerned with fluids that are contained like in a pipe or a hose or a straw, um, but we'll see other examples and we'll kind of talk about a few other examples. Um, so a few examples, water flowing through a hose, Air in a heating system, like the, think about the air vents in your house. Um, since it's summer right now, you're probably thinking more of air conditioning. Um, and then an IV line is a very important fluid motion system in medicine. Um, your arteries and veins would fall under that same category. Fluids are moving in a closed pipe. Um, so this is a very important concept if you're going to go into a field like nursing, anesthesiology, surgery, anything like that. Um, an ideal fluid, remember the properties of an ideal fluid, which is the only thing we're going to consider. Uh, first of all, they're incompressible. That means they have a constant density. We're always going to assume that when they move, they exhibit laminar flow. Uh, the word laminar means sheet-like. Um, think about the laminating machine. You put something between two sheets of plastic and it laminates it. What that means, um, real quickly, is that all parts of the fluid are moving in the same direction. That means there's no turbulence, like fluids going in circles. So that picture would show laminar flow. Everything's moving to the right. If we were to do something crazy, like put a rock in there, then the fluid may go around the rock and then fill the void in between, meaning the fluid's not all going the same direction. We refer to that as turbulent flow. So if you've ever been on an airplane and the airplane gets buffeted up and down, they call that turbulence. That's because the air under the wing is not all going the same direction. That causes the lift in the wing to change. Therefore, the airplane bounces up and down. The third thing that we're considering or that we're going to assume with an ideal fluid is that there's no friction between the fluid and its container. So all the fluid moves through the pipe without slowing down due to the pipe. So when a fluid is moving, there are three ways that we could express the rate at which flow, fluid is flowing. Um, the first thing to do is simply measure how much volume of fluid is moving past a certain point in a given period of time. That's referred to as the volume flow rate. So volume of fluid that goes through a point per given time, typically per second. The way we would symbolize that is simply by putting a delta V over a delta T. Now, this would be really important to make a capital V with. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get it confused with velocity. And then you've got like the equation for acceleration. There's really no standard symbol, at least that I know of, uh, for volume flow rate. You just write change in volume over time. And the unit would be cubic meters per second. If you've ever been um, tubing down the Guadalupe River, and you want to check beforehand to see if the river is actually going to be flowing, you can actually go and you can look up what the flow rate of the uh, dam is that feeds the river. And that's going to be given in gallons per second. Being all physics, we're going to be in meters cubed per second. The second thing that you can do is you can study the mass flow rate. The only difference between mass flow rate and volume flow rate Instead of volume, we're talking about mass that goes by a point per second. Uh, we would use a similar symbol. We'd say delta M over delta T. And we'd use a similar unit like kilograms per second. Those two things are going to be closely related. Wherever the volume flow rate is greater, the mass flow rate is going to be greater as well. Typically for rivers, you use volume flow rate. For IV lines... Um, talk about putting medicine into a patient, you probably would use more like grams per second because that's the important measurement to them. Now the third way to measure the fluid flow rate is just with a good old velocity. Pick a point in the fluid, like imagine a water molecule, and then just figure out what its displacement is for a given um, period of time. So the fluid would have a certain velocity, delta x over delta t. We still use the symbol v for velocity, still use the unit meter per second. Um, 
you might see that you have capital V's and lowercase v's running around here. So it's really important that you keep those distinguished. Otherwise, you're going to get yourself really, really confused. So let's see if we can understand what flow rate means. So imagine that you have a pipe, and we pick an imaginary point in the pipe, call it point A. And let's just say that this represents two cubic meters of fluid. Now, understand that there's still fluid throughout the pipe. We're just focusing on that particular chunk. So let's suppose that this represents the fluid at time t equals one second. And then a second later, that two, meter, two cubic meters of fluid has moved to the other side of point A. What that shows us is that two cubic meters of fluid has gone by point A in one second. That means that the fluid flow rate, the volume flow rate, which we would symbolize as delta V over delta T, is two cubic meters in one second, or we could write that as two cubic meters per second. If we want to know what the mass flow rate was, we need to remember that mass and volume are related by the density. Density is mass over volume. So if I know what the volume of something is, I know what the mass is. So if this was water, I know that 2 cubic meters of water with a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter would have a mass of 2,000 kilograms. And so that same volume of water represents a mass of 2,000 kilograms. So if I want to know what the mass flow rate is, I simply multiply the volume flow rate by the density of the fluid. And so delta M over delta T, that's the mass flow rate, will be 1,000 kilograms per cubic meters times the 2 cubic meters per second. See that the cubic meters cancel out, and we would get 2,000 kilograms per second. Now, depending on your situation, one of those, may, those measurements may be more meaningful to you than the other. If you're putting medicine into a patient, the mass of the medicine is probably the important thing to you. If you're talking about tubers on a river, you want to know if they're going to have enough water to float in, the volume flow rate would probably be more meaningful to you. So, how does this relate to the velocity of a fluid? Let's kind of draw another simple picture. If we're talking about the velocity of the fluid, let's pick just one particular um, water or fluid molecule and focus on it. Let's suppose that at one second it's at that position, and then at two seconds it's at that position. And let's suppose these positions are four meters apart. If we do our simple velocity as displacement over time, our very first physics equation, that would show us that the velocity of that piece of fluid is 4 meters per second. Nothing has really changed there. Now we can relate the velocity of the fluid to those other two measurements that we just talked about. Most directly we can relate it to the volume flow rate. So if you kind of consider a larger chunk of fluid um, with an area A, that would be the cross-sectional area of your pipe, if it moves a, different, a distance delta x, delta to x times a represents a volume. And so the velocity of this fluid would be delta x over delta t. The volume change would be the area times delta x. And so if I want to know the volume flow rate or the change in volume over time, I can take a delta x over t, and of course delta x over delta t is the velocity. So the volume flow rate, delta v over delta t, is equal to the area of the pipe, the cross-sectional area, times the velocity. In other words, if you've got a wider pipe, the fluid will have a larger volume change, volume flow rate, as it flows through with the same velocity. So, the big idea. What goes into a pipe obviously has to come out. 
That's an idea that we're going to refer to as continuity, namely fluid flow continuity. So the same amount of fluid that passes by a particular point in a pipe, a closed pipe, must pass through all the points on that same pipe as long as it doesn't open up or close or have any branches. Now when I say amount, that can mean either mass, remember mass is conserved, or it could mean volume. And the reason that it's important that we have ideal fluids, we only say this for ideal fluids, is because they're incompressible, meaning that the volume can't change. If that weren't true, then we really couldn't say that. So let's imagine a pipe that looks like this. And let's suppose that at one point we have five cubic meters of fluid passing through in one second. That means the volume flow rate will be five cubic meters per second. At another point on the pipe, we also have to have the same five cubic meters per second pass through it. The volume flow rate has to be constant. And so what goes in must come out. If that wasn't true, then the fluid really wouldn't be flowing in a laminar flow. There would be turbulence and air and stuff like that mixed in with it. And so that has to be true in order for fluids to flow through a pipe like we know they would. So in order for that to be true, in order for delta V over delta T to be constant, then the velocity has to increase whenever the area decreases. So if the area gets smaller, that means that the velocity has to get larger. So at the first point, the 5 cubic meters per second is equal to a big area times a small velocity, whereas at the second point, that same 5 cubic meters per second is equal to a small area times a big velocity. Wherever the area gets smaller, the fluid has to go faster. So there's a couple of places where you can actually see this in your everyday life. One example, if you've ever been tubing or rafting down a river, typically rivers are faster where they are narrower. If you ever had that experience, kind of think back on it. Another common example is a garden hose. If you want to squirt somebody with a garden hose, typically you put your thumb over the end to make it spray. That's making the fluid come out of the hose faster. You can see that as it's going farther. So one question you may be asked in the very near future, why does that happen? Why would you put your thumb over the end of a garden hose to make it spray? So if we take that idea and we apply it to the A times velocity equation, since the volume flow rate is always constant and the volume flow rate equals A times V, then the quantity area times velocity has to be constant as well. And that's typically written like this. Area at one point times the velocity at one point equals the area at a second point times the velocity at a second point. That's got to be true at all points, any two points, um, throughout the fluid, throughout the pipe. That's often referred to as the equation of continuity, if you want to be all fancy about it. So again, where A is small, the velocity must be large, and vice versa. So let's look at a real simple example. Suppose that we have a room that's got two air ducts coming in and out of it. And the dimensions of the room might look like that. And one air duct coming in has an area of 0 0.01 square meters and the air duct going out has an area of 0 0.03 square meters. And suppose that we want to know how much or how fast we have to push air in and out of the room if we want to replace all of the air in the room every 10 minutes. So we want to know what is the velocity of the air in those two air ducts. This is a very common question uh, that somebody who's designing a ventilation system might ask. And there's standards for how often you exchange the air in a given kind of room, and that tells you how to build your air ducts and the systems that move the air through them. So we want to figure out the velocity of the air coming out of the first duct. Do that in blue. And we want to figure out the air velocity of the air going into the second duct, which I'll do that in red. 
So first thing I'm going to do is figure out the volume of this room. Just do all three dimensions multiplied by each other since it's a rectangle. And I figure out that this room has a volume of 16 cubic meters. If I figure out the volume flow rate, that would be 16 cubic meters over 10 minutes. I'd rather have that in seconds, so I'm going to change 10 minutes to 600 seconds. And so my volume flow rate is something like 0 0.0267 cubic meters per second. Now that's the volume flow rate coming out of the first air duct, because that number has to be constant. And it's also the volume flow rate coming into the second air duct. Again, that number has to be constant. So I'm going to set the area of the first duct times its velocity equal to 0 0.02667 cubic meters per second. And then it's just a matter of solving for the velocity. So divide both sides by the area. The area of that um, duct is 0 0.01 square meter. Notice what happens with the units. So our answer should be in meters per second. That means that we probably did this correctly. And when you do that division, you get something like 2.7 meters per second, which isn't terribly fast, but you really don't want it to be fast. You want things in the room blowing around next to the air duct. Now, we could do something very similar, actually the exact same thing to figure out V2, or we can realize that it's going to be a third of V1 since the area of the second duct is equal to three times the area of the first duct. So we could you know, save ourselves a little bit of work just by doing a little bit of proportional reasoning there. So we're going to see lots of examples using this idea of fluid flow continuity. The basic idea, again, is that wherever the area is smaller, the velocity must be larger because in a closed pipe, the flow rate, both the volume and the mass flow rate, has to be constant. That's the big idea. The end.